Hey everyone, it's Dave Asprey with Bulletproof Radio. Today's cool fact of the day is that if you provide it with an adequate amount of oxygen, your heart can actually continuously beat outside of your body because it has basically its own, its own system for electrical activation, which is kind of cool and also kind of creepy. Today's guest on the show is Dr. Joel Kahn. Joel is a clinical professor at Wayne State University School of Medicine and the director of cardiac wellness at Michigan Healthcare Professionals. Now, he's also the author of this book, The Whole Heart Solution. And Joel is interesting because uh, you're going to be you got to be ready for this. Joel's a vegan. And Joel, are, are you an advocate of a low-fat diet? People can't throw things through the camera at me. I'm okay. <laughs> well, a few people wouldn't do that. Because I, I, to answer your question, I know that. And I love your community and I love your podcast. And thank you very much. Um, I teach patients about low fat, vegetable based diets for advanced cardiac disease. So it's a small slice of the entire world. So, specifically, when people are dealing with cardiac disease, uh, um, especially like right post operatively, right. there's there's a couple different schools there and certainly you have a very evidence-based approach and when my dad had his heart attack going back quite a few years he definitely went on a, an extreme low-fat diet because of the convincing evidence that at least for some period of time that it, it causes a reduction in plaque and right. he was fully calcified and had had a good amount of plaque so that's one of the things you advocate one of the reasons you advocate um, this style of eating right. and you and I, I we're, we have mutual respect, we're friends. <laughs> and uh, we met at Joe Polish's event. We're, we're here at JJ Virgin's he event for health influencers. Uh, I don't think we're probably going to come to a final consensus on the ultimate diet for every person on earth. In fact, I don't know what that is, and neither do you. <laughs> we can agree on that. <laughs> right. Um, so, but there's a huge amount of, of really interesting stuff though that, that we will talk about today. Yeah. And I want to make sure that, that if you have stuff where you say, no, actually, I, I don't agree with saturated for fat for that, just feel free to throw it out there. Right. Like, I, I am not the source of all knowledge. I'm pretty good at, at research and I'm pretty good at talking with experts, which is why you're here. Okay, excellent. All yeah. right. Love it. So now that we've got that on the table, <laughs> yes, there are vegans on Bulletproof Radio. And I have lots of vegan friends, and I was a vegan and all that, I so know, there, there's, no, well, there's no like weirdness there. Um, I wanted to talk with you about mitochondrial function. Excellent. So first off, for people who are listening, if they're long-time listeners, you guys already know who you are. You know what mitochondria are. But for the rest of the people who are just tuning in, can you tell us, like from a doctor perspective, but one that everyone can understand, what is a mitochondria and why should we care about it? Sure. So a mitochondria, actually, cool fact for the day. Some people <laughs> think mitochondria came from bacteria and entered our cells and stuck, which is why there's RNA and DNA in mitochondria and there's RNA and DNA in your nucleus, if you remember from biology from you know, high school. And most listeners probably are pretty familiar with mitochondria. But they're the site within the cell outside the nucleus where energy is produced. You just talked about it and I've seen it. You take a uh, heart out of a living animal lab and the heart will beat for a period of time. It will stop beating because it'll deplete the primary source of energy called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. There's about only 10 seconds of stores of ATP in an average cell in the heart because it's such a metabolically active organ. All that happens in the mitochondria. It's the powerhouse of the cell, it's where ATP is produced, and it's a very complex, convoluted little organelle, very prone to toxicity, which is, I think we're gonna talk a little bit about toxicity in mitochondria. You know, a healthy life requires healthy mitochondria, which is not a concept most people even think about for a moment. What happens if your mitochondria aren't healthy? Um, you will reduce the amount of ATP, adenosine triphosphate, the master energy molecule of the mitochondria in the body. So you can just generalize to have fatigue and part of chronic fatigue syndrome, part of fibromyalgia rheumatica. Some of these pain and fatigue syndromes are believed to be mitochondrial dysfunction. And certainly in my world, the cardiac world, uh, you will get short of breath. You will have uh, inability to do your activities. We call that congestive heart failure. Congestive heart failure is either a loss of mitochondria from a heart attack or dysfunction of the mitochondria that are in the existing heart. I'm in the middle of filming a documentary called Moldy. And huh. I've 
flown around the country and I've interviewed some experts on biotoxins and right. also a whole bunch of people who, like me, were diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, Lyme disease, toxic mold exposure, all these things. And one of the things that, that all of them have in common is low mitochondrial function. And I, I know one of the contributors can be neurotoxins, but there's some lifestyle things that also contribute to low mitochondrial function. Like, I know that, that, that you can make very poor life choices. What are the things in your experience that people are doing that make their mitochondria weak? Well, there is, um, there's important environmental toxins. You mentioned one, which is potentially mycotoxins. Mm -hmm. We've learned recently air pollution is a mitochondrial toxin. The data that air pollution triggers heart attack and even heart death has increased in the last five, 10 wow. years. It's fascinating. Turn off the factories in Beijing for the Olympics, heart attacks stop. Turn the factories on when the Olympics are over, heart attacks resume. Fascinating published data. Whoa. Yeah, I'm glad to teach you something. I did not see Absolutely that. Absolutely neat data. And, you know, multiple uh, sources of that. Okay, um, stop for a second there. For your patients, is there an air filter that you recommend because of that study? I do suggest they get a HEPA air filter Any in the HEPA? house. Okay. I don't have a particular brand right. to recommend you. And just general sensitivity, jogging next to a truck is probably not going <laughs> to benefit you. Uh, even though you're jogging. So it's sensitivity to where you are and getting into nature and um, you know, same thing, bringing dry cleaning in the house in the bag that's full of perk, one of the environmental toxins is uh, probably an offside to having a nicely starched shirt. Leave it in your garage for a couple of days and let it off gas is another way to make your mitochondria uh, better. Heavy metals, uh, mercury in your mouth, which if I'll keep my mouth closed because mm -hmm. I still have mine. Uh, but sensitivity to lead t exposures. These are all mitochondrial toxins that everybody listening has to deal with, although they're very silent and difficult to identify. Um, then you get into food, and um, you, know, there, uh, you need CoQ10. You're very mm -hmm. much in the same mindset I am, and about age 40, we're making less and less CoQ10, and I am a big advocate of bringing your levels up after about age 40 or earlier, and that would be a great nutritional way to approach it, for sure. And then the neat ones like PQQ and some of the other mitochondrial boosters. So I, I take about 300 milligrams of CoQ10. Yeah. Uh, I take that every day. And of course I use it in unfair advantage with PQQ, but there it's more as a catalyst to increase absorption. And it, it's a trivial amount. Why specifically CoQ10? Um, CoQ10 is a very powerful antioxidant. And because oxygen is being used in the mitochondria in the process of producing ATP energy molecule, the mitochondria is very sensitive to oxidant stress, and CoQ10 is an antioxidant. And about age 40, we just start producing dramatically less and less CoQ10 uh, every decade of our life. So it's a very smart thing to add CoQ10 in to just maintain mitochondrial function, skeletal muscle function, heart function. Um, and so that's one aspect of it. And then CoQ10, in, if anybody remembers the electron transfer chain, you need mm -hmm. CoQ10 to make that ATP. So it not just protects the mitochondria, it's an important ingredient in the recipe to make ATP. So uh, no question about it. And then we can talk about drugs like statins that deplete CoQ10 with so many millions of Americans taking statins. I would not let anybody take a statin without taking supplemental CoQ10 if they need to take the drug. Awesome. Yep. It's interesting that you mentioned statins, and, and one of the things that I've been recommending as a result of the work I've done with the anti-aging research, just running a, a group like that and having multiple people come in, they've been warning about you know, mitochondrial, I don't know if toxicity is the right word, but suppression because of the CoQ10 depletion that comes from statin drugs. So, so if you're taking a statin, so you do use statins in your practice? I do. I'm very selective. Okay. I'm very careful to make sure somebody actually has coronary artery disease that might justify the consideration. Uh, do I pull the gun to use, it's bulletproof, so I can mm -hmm. pull the gun to use a statin, <laughs> but with much less frequency, and much lower dosing. And, and then you Coupled you with CoQ10, it. always. Okay. Um, and it works quite well. Uh, but you can do tremendous things with lifestyle, tremendous things with detoxification, heart math. I mean, manage ah. stress, <laughs> manage stress, lower cortisol, cholesterol goes down, and you haven't used a drug. It, it's interesting, you talk about cholesterol going down. What are the limits of cholesterol that you target? Um, quite low compared to probably what you know uh, the current trend is. It's clearly, we all know, the backbone of vitamin D, the backbone of sex steroids. Um, it's important in membranes of all cells and brain cells. There are some natural experiments of people who have um, a defect in cholesterol production. Um, 
alpha beta lipoproteinemia is one. And they run cholesterols of 90 to 100, total cholesterols their whole life. They actually have a bit of a life extension. Maybe there's other reasons we don't understand and the cholesterol is just something we can measure and there's some other cellular function that gives them a slight survival advantage and it's unrelated specifically to cholesterol. But they seem to have perfectly fine sexual hormone function, vitamin D function. To answer your question, I don't want them under 150 total cholesterol, under 140, I'll back off. And if they're that low with medication, I'll get rid of the medication and let them thrive on uh, you know, lifestyle related matters. Uh, but I don't like them sitting, you know, in the high 200s, 300s. So, yeah, high 200, 300 is getting yeah. up there. But I, if someone's mid 200s, do you treat that with drugs? Well, my approach is I find out if they're not known to be a heart patient, haven't had the bypass, the heart attack, I'll strive hard to examine their arteries. I'll do ultrasounds of the carotids, the carot CIMT. <laughs> I'll do a calcium score, which is a very low radiation exposure. And with a antioxidant vitamin pack, selenium, glutathione support, you get even less... Um, DNA breakage. I don't know if you know that. Some nice published data uh, that you can have a CAT scan with less radiation potential yeah. damage. Yeah. Interesting. After 911, scientists in Denver developed a way to deal with a dirty bomb, a vitamin pack for a dirty bomb. Never happened. They were left with this formula that the government had given them funding, animal and human research, that demonstrated you can decrease by 50% DNA damage exposure to radiation. And they had nothing to do with it, so they created a supplement company in Nashville, Tennessee, and they. What's sell it called? It. It's called Premier Micronutrient. I don't have any financial yeah, interest. I've, I've never looked at it. Yeah, BioShield R1. You take it 45 minutes before a nuclear or a CAT scan study, and you feel that, or before wow. you get on an airplane. It's an approach. So, Interesting. I had a conversation. Um, I, I support the SpaceX. Okay. And our, our exploration of space, which is uh, amazing. So I, I get to spend some time with people who are solving, like, how are we going to get to Mars? How are we going to mine asteroids? And they're doing it, like, really fast. But the one thing, when I, I would ask, I asked uh, Peter Diamandis this, I, I'm like, Peter, what about this whole, you get cooked by radiation on your way to Mars? And he goes, well, that's not solved yet. And I, I believe that hacking the human body is the only way we could get to Mars. And I didn't know about that supplement, but you can make yourself more radiation resilient. In fact, before you fly, ionizing radiation from just flying in the atmosphere, yeah. Yeah. Should, about, should people uh, consider antioxidants like CoQ10 there? Well, there's, there's data that pilots have an increased risk of melanoma, and it's believed that's the cause. There's data that pilots that eat more fruits and vegetables have less cancer development and less melanoma specifically. There's this BioShield vitamin supplement data. And then there's anecdotal data. A lot of people I know will take a handful of chlorella is a really powerful, I do. and I do before flights, both from getting contaminated air in the airplane and radiation. So there's a few strategies there. You, you can't fight it, it's out there, but you can protect your body more. All right, so tell me what you take before you get on a plane. Like, we'll compare notes. Well, I will take a this glutathione support, um, okay. and probably your product would be an excellent one to mm -hmm. consider doing, and chlorella. Those are the two things. So I glutathione take. and chlorella? Yeah, okay. and, and I'm talking a pretty darn good handful of chlorella, several grams of chlorella. Yeah, I'll do like 30 of little chlorella yeah, tap capsules. Yeah. I'll do a shot of glutathione force. Uh, which is a highly bioavailable one. I'm guessing you use something that's bioavailable as well, yes. unless I've sent you mine, I don't know. Yeah. And then uh, I also do uh, 300 milligrams of CoQ10, and let's see, sometimes I'll do uh, Delta Gamma uh, High Tocopherol Tocotrienol Vitamin E. Right. Uh, I'll take a Transresveratrol, a Pterostilbene, and I'll do two unfair advantages, yeah. which is the Pretty PQQ. Good stuff. A little 200 uh, micrograms of selenium would be maybe the last component. Good idea cofactor and glutathione production, although you're taking the pure glutathione, so it may not be necessary. Okay, you're taking yours with NAC, is that how I'm you're doing it? I'm taking with NAC, exactly, okay. yeah. And, and by the way, we totally geeked out, and I apologize if you're listening to this going, what did they just say? That was gobbledygook. NAC is N-acetylcysteine, it's an amino acid you can buy at the store, and when you take it with vitamin C and alpha lipoic acid, it increases production of glutathione, which is the primary antioxidant that protects your liver and your cells and your brain. The master antioxidant. Did I just learned 600 milligrams twice a day of NAC during the winter drops flu rates by about 50%. I, the, yeah, I did not know that. It's a published randomized study. So I do that already, but uh, might explain why I typically go a winter without flu in cold, cold Michigan. I believe it, yeah. absolutely, yeah, yeah. that anything that raises glutathione is going to be a good move. Yeah, make a healthier person. It's totally untouched in cardiology. I mean, the idea How of glutathione support in cardiovascular disease is basically uh, infantile, so plenty of room to work there. 
So I have a confession to make. Yes. Um, when my dad had his heart attack, and this is going back, I think, like a decade, yeah. I, I was well steeped in the uh, in the anti aging techniques, and I was shocked. It was in New Mexico, and his cardiologist was like, you know, here have some Jello from the hospital. And, and this isn't yeah. going to cut it. So I made him a, a smoothie and maybe added a few ingredients that he didn't really know about. And it was a whey protein smoothie because I wanted the glutathione from whey, right. and that's one of the things that whey does. Right. But I also added NAC, and I added acetyl L-carnitine and vitamin B12 and a whole bunch of other, essentially everything I knew in D-ribose, anything that would increase mitochondrial function. And gee, maybe my dad was kind of opposed to that because he was just had his chest sort of ripped open. It's a little bit traumatic, as you well know, because right. you, you've done this. Um, but he, he looked at me 10 minutes later and goes, Oh my God! I, I feel like, like I, I feel like myself again. Like this is amazing and, and transformative. I'm guessing. I mean, my at the time, I, like helping mitochondria after surgery, any kind of surgery, just has to be a good idea. But but do you well, see when you fix mitochondria people it, that they feel that much better? Well, I have great experience in the office. They will take your vitamins away in the hospital. So we snuck yeah, it in. It's amazing. <laughs> There's a group in Australia that has been studying CoQ10 before and after open heart surgery. Um, they show tremendous benefit. Uh, you have to start it more than 12 hours before and similar support. But uh, uh, we know that in heart disease, heart failure, CoQ10 levels in mitochondria, because we they biopsy them in open heart surgery, they're depleted by the time you're at that point. So build them up beforehand. People who get mitochondrial support CoQ10 before open heart surgery get discharged quicker, spend less money, less complications. So hospitals should grab onto this. This is all peer-reviewed data. But uh, there is such a suspicion in the organized hospital world about vitamins in the United States. It's it's a detriment. I mean, you can't give vitamin D hardly in a hospital in the United States. I mean, it's absolutely prehistoric. Uh, in the outpatient setting, the experience has been that, give credit to Steve Sinatra, an integrative yep. cardiologist, who identified three things that support ATP production, mitochondrial production, and applied them to his congestive heart failure and cardiac patients, CoQ10, magnesium, uh, and and uh, ribo, actually an L-carnitine originally, yep. or L-car. And then Jim Roberts, a cardiologist in Toledo, added in ribo, so kind of four yeah. supplements. And you can add taurine if you want. So my routine with sick heart patients is those four or five supplements, dramatic improvement. I, I mean, we're talking a number called your ejection fraction, basically your V8 engine or your V4. I see people walk in and with a V4 engine heart, and three months later, measurements are V8 engine hearts almost routinely, which is transformative, but still barely a kind of um, supported by medical research. It just hasn't been. Some university needs to grab onto 100 people and prove the point, because it will be proved. So ejection fraction is, is an interesting variable. And, and you may have heard me talking about this on Bulletproof Radio, but it would have been a long time ago. One of the reasons I recommend high intensity uh, interval training, whether it's sprints or lifting heavy things, is that it makes you have a larger ejection fraction versus doing long distance cardio, which trains you to have a, a faster heartbeat with a smaller ejection fraction. Right. And, and the way I, I explain this, the way I envision this, and, and I might be off a little bit, I, I'm, you're an expert in hearts, I'm not, but I, I look at it like, like an engine, like there's a piston, right? And the piston can push so much fluid, like, it, like it, in a cylinder, it would just push it through. And when it does that, it would either move a large, like a, a large cylinder, a large stack of, of, of blood. So you're walking along, a tiger jumps out, you say, ah, and you don't want to have your heart beat faster and just put little bits of, of blood through. You want like a lot of blood to go. And to do that, you have to have a very strong heart. Right. And so one of the like side benefits of doing heavy squats until you can't do another one or using like an arcs fit machine which is you know one repetition to blow your muscles out would be the ejection fraction benefits yeah. is my picture in my head right or am i simplifying too much i think actually on a cellular level you're probably getting better mitochondrial biogenesis you're probably actually it's a better stimulus to create more mitochondria and therefore you can lift more blood without a high heart rate uh, and that seems to be the research for. So the idea of lifting blood is the ejection fraction. Like I'm, I'm explaining that in an adequate way. Yes, you are. Okay, cool. And we were talking just before we maybe go off the kind of cardiac support, mitochondrial support issue. So, um, you know, my practice, as I say, uh, nutraceutical supported congestive heart failure has been 
tremendously helpful for people. But just brand new, like in the last two weeks, that the issue of gut and the heart, which comes oh, up yeah. now and then. But we've got now a nice randomized study in very sick congestive heart failure patients with low ejection fraction. So the V4 engine heart probiotic use, it was actually Saccharomyces boulardii, and it wasn't oh. that much, about three million. The yeast that eats other yeast. The yeast that eats other yeast, actually about eight weeks later, they documented ejection fractions going up, walking distance improving, symptoms uh, ameliorating, and you know it'll take 10 years to see that show up in a hospital formulary, but the idea that strengthening the defenses of the gut uh, is a heart-related therapy is just mind-blowing. So, so Saccharomyces boulardii is a, a classical treatment to treat candida. Because when you have candida, this yeast overgrowth, right. um, then this stuff will eat that. And I used to have really bad candida back when I had Lyme disease and all these other things. It, it was a terrible problem. And I know that when people have candida, it sets off autoimmunity. And candida itself can make some toxins that may have a mitochondrial impact, and certainly they yeah. just make you feel crappy. So now I'm wondering though, is there a study that you're familiar with where they just give fluconazole or an antifungal to people with cardiac problems? Because it seems like if Saccharomyces boulardii does that, it's an antifungal yeah. approach. It's interesting. You know, there have been antibiotic trials of coronary artery disease. You, you, this is off topic, but if you look at a plaque in the carotid mm -hmm. removed at surgery, plaque in the heart when your father had bypass, if they took a tissue, you can often identify bacteria, you can identify H. pylori. So there have been some trials using the same antibiotic protocol for GI ulcers, H. pylori for heart disease, and you can see some improvement. Wow. Really interesting stuff. Um, but those are all antibiotics. I, tetracycline and minocycline, I haven't seen anything with antifungal therapy. I, I am so intrigued. Yeah. You have to deal with the glutathione because fluconazole, which is a, a wonder drug, it was made for, and you know this, I'm mostly talking for people listening, it was made for um, AIDS patients because they kept getting really bad fungal infections, but now it's like the one pill you can take for a yeast infection and it just decimates yeast in the body. So there's a group of very alternative people who say, well, it may have other cancer protective effects, but I, I, I'm so intrigued. I, I don't know how you would do a study on this, not, not, my, not my area of expertise, right. but I suspect that lowering the fungal load, just the, the, the fungal gut biome in cardiac patients could be a whole area of exploration. Uh, maybe that's where Saccharomyces worked. I mean, maybe eight weeks is enough to change the microbiome and uh, the balance. Could be. Wow, and, and... You know, the theory in the article was uh, there's no doubt that eating creates what's called a metabolic endotoxemia. Mm. If you have a sick gut from gluten sensitivity, dairy sensitivity, alcoholism, excess sugar perhaps, and all the rest. Standard American diet, every meal releases endotoxin or a bacterial toxin in the bloodstream that's clearly been shown to affect cardiac function. Um, and it probably happens in every one of us after every meal to a trivial amount. Well, probably but, not every meal because high fat meals increase endotoxin absorption. High fat meals release into the bloodstream. It, 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 if you eat fat yeah. with a meal, it increases the absorption of your, your gut's endotoxins, and that's a bad thing. Okay. You don't want, I mean, you know it's a bad thing, right? right. But so, one of the reasons that a low fat diet can work okay. if, if its endotoxin is one of the problems. Okay. An argument to support yeah. a, a low-fat vegan post-cardiac right. event thing would be that if you've got endotoxin formation in the gut, yeah. then don't let it in, don't eat fat. And Interesting. I, I mean, I, when, when I was a raw vegan, I got my cholesterol down to 136. Yeah. Uh, and now my cholesterol is probably closer to 236. It runs around 220-ish, depending on the, the test and whatever I had the day before. I feel better with my numbers where they are now. Like my testosterone levels are, are back without supplementation, even though I used to supplement testosterone. But I also specifically have addressed endotoxins because I've had really bad gut problems. I was on antibiotics for 15 years for chronic sinus infections, and like I didn't start out biologically strong. So for endotoxins, like you can take charcoal to bind them. Um, in fact, even... Uh, the brain octane oil that, that's in Bulletproof Coffee. In some studies of endotoxins and liver protection, um, there's a, a beneficial effect there. Right. But I, I'm really concerned about them. So, you know, resistant starch, uh, taking probiotics, eating properly fermented foods, which a lot of fermented foods aren't, right. uh, all those things could potentially be mediating heart attack risk. They get heart attack, and again, in the people who've already had an event that have tendency to congestive heart failure, which is what this Saccharomyces study was, yeah, they probably could be very therapeutic.
I'm so intrigued yeah. by that. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't know about the Saccharomyces. Yeah. Uh, I'll send you. I'll send you. It just came out, and I'll send it to you. I'll actually yeah. put that up on the blog because it, it's so important to take some kind of probiotic. And one of the difficulties that I've had is some probiotics make me gain weight like a pound a day. Oh and goodness, wow. and there's, a, there's a whole thing that happens with histamine formation and nitrosamine formation in the gut. And I... I I see all, all of, we're here at JJ's thing. So there's all these health professionals he, who are here, and a lot of us are saying eat fermented foods. Right. But I, I have some concerns, because like this fermented food isn't this fermented food. Right. Is there any kind of fermented food that's bad for the heart that you know about? Other than beer, I guess. <laughs> um, beer in general, I wouldn't say is bad for the heart. I mean, one strategy to avoid heart attack is a regular small amount of alcohol, according to multiple kind of epidemiologic uh, studies. Uh, alcohol or beer? Well, it's all it's across the board. Okay. But you know, usually it's one ounce hard liquor, five ounces of wine, eight ounces of beer is about the same alcohol content, and studies don't differentiate. I would always advise limiting and emphasizing Pinot Noir or other red wines um, if you're if you're going to intake. But um, we got to get back to the original question. As far as probiotic, uh, as far as fermented foods, no, yeah. I'm not aware of anyone that would be better than others for the heart. But I agree, there's a lot of products in the store that are people are buying, thinking that's a fermented food. I, you know, if it's not in the refrigerated section, it's not living <laughs> culture. The pickles that are in the jar, that are in the regular store shelf, I have been pasteurized, and the sauerkraut in that section have been pasteurized. They're not alive. They're not adding any cultures. So that's the easiest differentiator I know. It, it's such a, a multivariate thing. Yeah. It, when when you look at heart studies, it, it seems like, like even the ones where they talk about um, red meat, uh, I, I look at those and I, I know that, that on your diet you don't do red meat and there's the TMAO thing, but they never look at, at least in the studies that I've seen, uh, there might be a few exceptions, but the, the difference between uh, grass-fed versus not grass-fed or deep-fried or aged for a long time versus not aged and it seems like each of those variables I, I can find a study that says well if you do meat this way it has this like some of the things like nitrates they have cardiac effects right so with all these things as a, a practitioner when a patient comes in and says you know i am presenting with early congestive heart failure how do you as someone who who has put together all the data and you're your focus on this problem. How do you sort out all that stuff in order to come up with with yeah, a protocol? You know, and you're right. I mean, the message that processed red meat is probably the lowest uh, on the pecking order of healthy foods. These all come from large databases yeah. that can barely get a one-time dietary history of meat consumption and differentiating grass-fed, not grass-fed. It's just not going to exist. It's going to be a real small boutique study that does a short-term follow-up that might it won't be make the point, but it's not going to be meaningful. It's not going to be convincing. Yeah. Um, you know, honestly, I, I am a pretty simple guy. I view nutrition on a spectrum, and just like you, I mean, most of my patients are still going to McDonald's and Burger yeah. King, and it's either economic need or family, you know, they're raising kids, and, you know, number one goal is to stop you know, hemorrhaging uh, their health in that kind of situation. So, I mean, I'm looking for low-hanging fruit and easy wins and uh, get them to appreciate that that is, you know, they don't understand the immediate harm that that can have to their health. There's a famous study, I don't know if you've seen it, I use it in every public lecture done by Robert Vogel, a University of Maryland cardiologist, a while back, 15 years. An egg McMuffin consumed by a healthy person and you want to measure endothelial function, artery function, within one hour you have had a dramatic drop in the health of your arteries when you eat one fast food hamburger uh, or one fast food egg muffin specifically. Add in hash browns, you get this effect longer and longer. You, you know, 20% of Americans are eating their breakfast at McDonald's and I'm not wow. dropping on McDonald's but they do get the, you know, the prize for probably the worst food in the world. We heard that on stage today at JJ's course. So just showing people, you know, that's the consummate evil. I mean, I'm just trying to drive them somewhere in the middle as a practical yeah. step. And then we can take them to a high end, uh, those that really want to pursue it and, you know, learn all the specifics and nutrition that you teach so well and others you're, can share. You're, you're definitely achieving that goal of moving people just to eat more vegetables and, and even more fruit. Like, yeah. like that's a lot better choice than more yeah. French fries oh. and egg muffins. So yeah. We're... Yeah. You don't have to look hard. This week, a study came out, fiber increase, mortality drops. I mean, it's not brand news to the medical world, but it was a million 
uh, member uh, participant, you know, kind of randomized study. So, you know, you need to get your fiber and you're going to get it from the plant kingdom. Yeah. I just try, I try and get, you know, there's a very good um, kind of vegetarian educator who says, you know, eat an apple a day and just get off dairy. If you do those two things, you're going to have made such a move forward in your health to take away a toxin, add in some fiber and enjoy a little better health. Right. Simple and steps. It's it, that's actually something that, that I would support, and it's funny because people are saying, "But David, like you're the, the king of butter." But when I look at what dairy protein does, uh, like like casein, I, I, th that was oh, one of the things yeah. from the China study Absolutely. book, which is uh, if you haven't heard of the China study, it, it's a, a a book that had a, a ton of data uh, supporting a, an animal and just a protein, uh, we'll say an animal protein free diet, um, and it's one that there's debate about. I think it's fair to say there's debate, but. Yeah. But the studies that he referenced about casein and cancer are pretty interesting, and they're specific to casein, that protein. So w would I suggest a high casein or a high dairy diet? I actually wouldn't. Well, you know, the, I mean, maybe you've, if you've studied, I mean, Colin Campbell's work, and I'm not, I've only met the man once, certainly not here to defend him, but it's actually 35 years of an uninterrupted NIH research project. I mean, he was able to qualify over and over and over, and it really came out of, he went, I, I believe it was the Philippines, and the richest children in the Philippines had the highest liver cancer rate. And he could not figure out why that was the case, and he was there to study epidemiology of uh, pediatric uh, liver cancer, and he found out the whole society was exposed to aflatoxin. Yes. But only the richest families were eating meat with any regularity. So these kids, actually, I mean, dairy, we, we were talking, it's actually animal protein, but he, he actually linked it most to casein. And that epidemiological observation that living in a wealthy home where you're drinking milk rather than water or you know, uh, tea and such, plus uh, the aflatoxin was the trigger for liver cancer, at least uh, based on studies. So that drove the whole next 35 years of research of how could animal protein trigger, you know, health issues, which is certainly something most people accept as a reasonable concept. It's interesting that about 60% of the mycotoxin that a cow eats ends up in casein. And yeah. so when you eliminate casein from yeah. dairy, you eliminate aflatoxin from it. Wow. And one of the, the things that's come out from my work is that we're doing more harm to ourselves than we recognize by consuming aflatoxin, ochratoxin, and some of the other common mycotoxins in our food supply at levels that are some, sometimes considered safe. And that by lowering those, by making better choices, like not eating something as simple as raisins. Well, raisins are not only like super high in sugar, they're also one of the higher aflatoxin dried fruits. Mm -hmm. So you just make these little switches and you eat something else. And when you do that, okay, there's no benefit to consuming aflatoxin. It doesn't, a little bit, doesn't make you stronger. It causes DNA damage. Like it increases risk of liver cancer pretty linearly, right? Okay. And so when I, I look at, at studies of vegetables or meat, I'm like, okay, how is it prepared? And did you control for this variable? Because this is, it's so annoying. It's why I did a film on, on in, like household environmental mold. This year, it's in your meat because it was in the crop, because there was a drought. And this next year, it's not. Yeah. And these are the things that just frustrate the heck out of me because I'm sensitive specifically to mycotoxins because I grew up in a moldy basement. Yeah. So to me, I, I don't feel good when I eat something that has mycotoxin. Like, like there's a built-in detector that I kind of wish wasn't there. Yeah. But I found when I go to other people and you control for that, uh, they can feel different. And I'm, I don't know how in medical research they like could control for so many variables yeah. and seasonal variables. That's why, you know, association is not causation. The majority of medical research are association studies. You just can't control and, you know, what were the people, what was the air like in the Philippines while they were breathing? I mean, Good question. so yeah. many issues come up. But uh, So I, I'm, I'm intrigued and, right. and I appreciate the work that you're doing on what's the data that we have, how do we reasonably reduce heart attack risk and someone who's already had a heart attack and that's or someone's about to have a heart attack congestive um, heart failure just to make sure yeah you know in okay. terms of uh, mitochondria support it's before and after okay. um before at any stage really of cardiac disease it, all that we talked about you know when we talk about nutritional you mentioned you know after heart attack i'd like to grab people and i have people come to me now and say you know Bypass has been recommended. I don't feel that bad. Can we approach this nutritionally? And Love it. I haven't lost my brain, but because there are people that need stents and bypass, and I participate, I put in stents in patients. But you can save some people these difficult and potentially life-threatening 
uh, procedures by altering their lifestyle. And number one on the list is always diet. And we go back to Dean Ornish and Caldwell Essest and a few other pioneers that now have 30 years of follow-up and some pretty profound data. So that's kind of the clinic that I run in Detroit and uh, seen amazing results. Uh, the only group I tell restrict oils, you can't, re you know, they're not fat-free diets, they're oil-free diets are these patients that are suffering advanced heart disease, trying to avoid procedures, trying to reverse disease uh, through nutrition, and it can be accomplished. All right, let's talk about tracking data because that's a big thing in, in biohacking. And you mentioned CIMT as a very good indicator of, of heart attack, cardiac risk, and there's also a calcium scan. Yeah. Um, which one is more useful? Do you use both? Should people pay attention to both? Well, I use both, but I follow CIMT because okay. the CAT scan is radiation. You know, it may be every seven to ten years, but I don't want to repeat it more than that, uh, even though it's a low amount of radiation. CIMT, an ultrasound technique, which is not covered by insurance, mm -hmm. so it's a bit of a limiting factor. A couple states in America do cover it, but that's it. Um, you can do it every six or 12 months, and you can get an accurate measurement and see plaque progressing or plaque regressing. It's actually not even plaque. It's the thickness of the wall of the artery, which is what's abnormal before there's even plaque. So it's very sensitive. You and I should have a carotid that's about 0 0.6 millimeters thick. If you measure it and it's 0 0.9 or 1.0, you have some advanced silent arterial damage, and we should institute an investigation why, and then a plan to uh, reverse it through all the technologies that are out there. What, what's a normal and what's an unhealthy calcium score? Uh, well, you, you want zero. I mean, okay. that's the winner. And uh, about, if you take a broad section, this is an important statistic for people here, about 40% of people that go for a calcium score are zeros. But that means 60% of people are walking around with silent heart disease they have no clue about. Because these are all asymptomatic people that just showed up and paid a couple hundred dollars or a hundred dollars to get a scan. Um, not all 60% are high numbers, but uh, about 25% are seriously high numbers. And what's a high number? Um, anything above 400 is above 400, the okay. it's calcification, but yet the artery can be wide open. Once you get much above 400, the odds that there's actually already a narrowing and obstruction, the stenosis, gets pretty high. So, so, so if someone has a score of 10, you don't pay much attention? I don't to ignore the 10, and I tell mm -hmm. them you're not a zero. There's some factor, and you need to watch it. But we're not doing stress tests. We're not doing catheterizations. But about 10% of people have a calcium score. This is a test that takes 30 mm -hmm. seconds. You hold your breath. It's the simplest thing in the world to do if you do not know you have heart disease and you want a clue, a screening test. 10% of the population is over 1,000. And, you know, this is, these are arteries that are like cast stone already, wow. yet they're playing tennis, they're jogging, they're participating in marathons, which may accelerate coronary calcification. There's several studies that's showing that, that um, ultra exercise, repeated ultra exercise, may be on the U-shaped curve, a little bit climbing the uh, ladder of detriment. Um, but anyway, so uh, those people really need intense, uh, you know, disease control and modification. So I was... I was concerned about, okay, what, what's my risk? I, I'm not worried about the amount of butter that I do because I've, I've looked at my inflammatory markers and, and all of that over the course of years, and it, that works for me. But about two years ago, just by, by virtue of where I was living, I started drinking lots more uh, San Pellegrino. It's mineral water, but it's relatively high in calcium. And I am scared as an anti-aging kind of guy of having free calcium in my body because free calcium, funny enough, tends to calcify tissues and you don't want to calcify tissues. So my approach to, to making sure I wasn't going to harm myself with free calcium was to make sure I had adequate vitamin D and vitamin K2. Man, I figured you were going to get there. Okay, okay cool. It, but still, did it work, yeah. right? So I decided I would get a calcium score after a couple of years of like, I probably drink like half my water is San Pellegrino just because the tap water I had didn't taste very good and the filtration system was hard to get to the cabin where I was working. So I'm like, I'll just bring a case of this water and I'll keep drinking it because I like bubbles. Like, it's a good deal. Uh -huh. And it also has sulfate in it. And uh, people ask, why do you keep drinking it? I'm like, well, I want sulfate because I think sulfate is an important signaling molecule. So yeah, I'm seriously geek. Sorry, guys. So <laughs> to make a long story short, uh, my score was uh, 1.8, which is pretty close to yeah. zero. And, and after that, it's probably calcium. within the error of the study. Yeah. That's yeah. like one pixel that's <laughs> lit up. And yeah. Yeah. I anyway, mean, if you follow people over 10 years and you're going to be on the planet for 100, so you should care, it, it, you need a calcium score over 10 to even see a slight bend in the curve from zero. Zero to 10 are all, you're fine. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm unworried about that, but I'll do it again in five years. And yeah. if it climbs to seven or something, I'm going to be like, all right, either I up the K2 or I down the calcium. But after two years of high calcium, um, with magnesium to balance it out too, I, I found that, okay, that's all right. And plus, when I first started doing Bulletproof Coffee, going back quite a few years now, I did have some concerns because the salt butter could kill you, right? Like, and there's there's some evidence that says butter could kill you, especially like butter from animals that eat the wrong stuff because it has different fatty acids in it. So I, I, I actually didn't have to say that. You said that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I was like, I was like, man, um, I, I'm, I'm concerned yeah. and I'm eating more of this than, than anyone I know ever has. Uh, so I, I got into the lab tests, what I was always into it, but I, I tracked myself really carefully because I was very willing to stop doing it. And I, I was, I felt so amazing and I still do. Yeah. I don't eat nearly as much butter now as I did then because for about two years I, I just craved it and I think it might have been a cell membrane thing. But it, the reason I'm talking about all this stuff it isn't to say butter's good or bad, but just that to track the warning signs of cardiac yeah. disease, I consider it terribly important. And we mentioned two, but what about the others? What are the other ones you track? Well, so, I mean, just to review, you, you can find somebody in your community, they may offer the carotid into millimeter thickness ultrasound. You, every city has a hospital that will offer coronary artery calcium scanning, a quick CT. Mm -hmm. You pay for it, but you don't pay as much as you used to. They've come down it, in price dramatically. It, it was $300 when I had yeah. mine and done in Seattle. we've got a great hospital that does it for $75. Oh, and that's a deal. And some do it for $49. And, you know, but there is no reimbursement generally for it. So then it gets, those are the two. There is actually a nice little unit. You'd be, you should get one for your playground uh, made by a company in Israel called Itamar, but it's called the Endopat. I don't know if you're aware oh, of that. Oh, I want one. Okay. You, you want an endopat. Um, you, for about 25000 you put a blood pressure cuff on your oh, arm. Oh, that's like a little bit pricey. Uh, you can get a donor. <laughs> they may want to give you one. Okay. And you'll put a specialized module on your finger and one on the other finger. So this is the control finger. This is the tested finger. Five minutes of total ischemia. The blood pressure cuff goes up above your blood pressure. Hand will get nice and cold and tingly. The minute you release it is when you get all those products going downstream, oh. and if you have a healthy endothelium, the inner lining of your arteries, you will see a increased flow of hyperemia of three, four, five times baseline flow in your control arm. And if you don't, you got sick endothelium. And now we can go to the Mayo Clinic and um, another few universities have followed coronary patients long-term. Sick endothelium, Thomas Sidingham, English physician 400 years ago, said a man is as old as his arteries. The endopad allows us to easily measure that. I do that in my clinic. If, it's you, awesome. if your reactive hyperemic index, it's called, is under 1.7, you've got very sick endothelium. We've got to work on it. We, you, know, you can do acute studies. You can do it on chronic. I've got to boost all the things you gave your father in that shake is what I'd be giving people to improve. Glutathione support, mitochondrial support, and then we'll retest them in six months. It's very motivating when they see the bad number. Because you can track this. Yeah, this is as non-invasive as something gets. Wow. Yeah. And this is totally unrelated to a pulse wave analysis to get blood pressure and things like that. It, that is a separate okay. way to measure arterial health and compliance, but this is specific to endothelial function. It's an FDA-approved machine. Wow. Yeah. And mere mortals can buy it who aren't medical licensed? Yeah, people? you know, uh, it's intermittently been covered by insurance right now. It's a cash pay also, so you got to have a motivated patient group. But it's, hmm. uh, it's 700, 800 peer-reviewed studies. I mean... I wonder if I could just have that in the Bulletproof Coffee Shop in Santa Monica. Just come in and get your coffee. Yeah, instead of a blood pressure cuff. Field. There you go. That's such a cool idea. Absolutely good. I, I, you know, thank you for telling what, me this, by the way. I did not know about this. Yeah, I'm so excited. Of course, just to spice this up, the poor man's endothelial function test is do you get an erection? Because to get an erection, <laughs> you have to have healthy endothelium. So that is actually a question every doctor should ask every male patient. And if the answer is no, get them to a cardiologist. So, so do, That's do, you, do you wake up with a kickstand? Is uh, a medical question. The, any way you want to say it. Is, is there wood <laughs> in the pencil is what I usually say. But All right. any way you want to broach the subject. Because, you know, and, uh, uh, erectile dysfunction is a early clue to heart disease because vascular supply is vascular supply. Awesome. We're running up on the end of our time. That was a PSA time. for heart disease checkups. It, yeah. it, it was, but yeah. <laughs> this is so cool. Um, there's a question that uh, I have asked every guest on the show at, at the end of the, the show, and it's one I'm, I'm really curious to hear what you have to say. And it's given your life's work and all the things you do that aren't work, but just, just what you've learned, what three recommendations would you make for someone who wants to perform well? And I don't mean perform well at any one thing. Whatever it is they do that's important to them, what, what's going to make you kick ass? 
Well, the, I mean, I'm really basic with my patients because I, I find them hard to make lifestyle change. We all do. So uh, these may not stimulate the crowd, but I have the three Fs that I tell every patient to concentrate on. Forks, fingers, feet. Fork, eat intelligently. We could go on for hours about that and we could define it differently, but that sure. they know that food is information, that food powers them, that food can power their mitochondria, food can reverse plaque, food can reverse diabetes, food can power the brain. You're into that. I'm very much into that. Uh, that's the fork. Feet, you got to move the body. We can talk. We're sitting. We should be standing during the interview. Get up every 10 <laughs> minutes uh, out of every hour. Uh, count your steps and just don't have, a, a, you know, a cytosis, which is what we now call a new disease that's dominating the Western world. And, um, and fingers, don't smoke. Okay, so if I, fing fingers, fork, feet, fingers, fork. And the other three that are the bonus for your listeners are sleep, stress, and love. If you can master those three aspects of your life, Everything beyond that is diminishingly small. I mean, it's a pretty simple formula to be heart attack free, cancer free, diabetes free in this country, but you just gotta be very disciplined in those three or six steps. You can grab however many you want. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Joel Kahn, you are author of Whole Heart Solution. And where can people find more about you, your book, and all the other things you do? Well, it's nice you ask. The book's on Amazon, Sam's Club, uh, Barnes & Noble's, the usual places. Uh, I'm at drjoelkahn.com, doctors, D-R, and uh, J-O-E-L-K-A-H-N.com. I invite everybody to join me over there. Thanks. You got it. We're going to have that in the show notes for you, so come on over to bulletproofexact.com and I'll give you a full transcript of this and links to the book and some of the other things that we talked about in the show. I'd be grateful if you'd also head on over to iTunes and leave a positive ranking and leave some comments here. This is kind of cool. I'm, I'm actually really pleased, Joel, that, that you came on to the podcast and that we're having a, a civil discussion, even though we, we have differing opinions. And I, I'm so tired in the health industry of, of yeah. you know, th this people put, you know, you're a quack because like, you disagree with me. It's like, no, I, I, I'm, not, I wouldn't, I'm not pointing at you. I'm not saying you're a quack and I don't believe that. But, but I see these accusations thrown around towards anyone who you disagree with online. And well, I give you credit. We know there's a problem. The problem yeah. is not small. The problem is going to destroy this country when we have 100 million diabetics yeah. and obesity is at 50 percent. So we need all kinds of approaches to try we, and solve that. So we, we do. And just thanks for coming on and having a civil conversation. We, we need more discussions like this between people who are obviously working to help others so we can figure out things that work and things that don't work. And I'm sure that some of my bulletproof Pump stuff doesn't out, work. Brother. And okay. likewise. So thanks, Thank man. You. Really you appreciate it. I appreciate it, too.